Theistic Evolution Critique, The Fossil Record. We've been studying a book called Theistic Evolution, The Scientific, Philosophical, and Theological Critique. There's the cover. Um, and uh, we are now into um, the uh, a chapter on the fossil record and what it has to say not just about uh, uh, the idea of evolution in, in the sense of uh, natural selection and uh, mutations, but also in the sense of common descent. And uh, before we go further, I should point out that there are several ways of looking at the creation-evolution controversy. There's what I would call young life creation, various stripes of that. There's what traditionally has been called old earth creation, but would be better called old life creation. There is theistic evolution uh, with intelligent design, that is, God guided an evolutionary process, and you can tell. And that's really the key difference between the that and the next one, which is non-intelligent design and theistic evolution. Maybe God guided it, maybe he didn't, but if you look at the data, you would never know. And finally, there is atheistic evolution. The, the book we're looking at is actually aiming not at atheistic evolution itself. It's primarily aiming at non-ID theistic evolution. Uh, but we're going to find out that it's starting to shade into uh, ID theistic evolution is going to take some uh, collateral damage starting this week. And um, the chapter we're looking at is Gunther, uh, written by Gunther Bechley and uh, Stephen Meyer. And it's in part one, the scientific critique of theistic evolution, but it is in section two, which is the case against universal common descent and for a unique human origin. Um, so it's actually uh, section two and three kind of together. Um, and this one is entitled The Fossil Record and Universal Common Ancestry. I've, abbrevi I've abbreviated that as The Fossil Record. Um, the summary of the chapter, which is sort of like an abstract, says, this chapter is the first of three examining the strength of the case for universal common descent, the second or the historical part of contemporary evolutionary theory and the part of evolutionary theory that theistic evolutionists most commonly defend. So they're going really after kind of the heart of theistic evolution. We begin in this chapter by examining the logical structure of the argument for universal common descent. Taking that structure into account, we then assess what the fossil record can tell us about whether all forms of life do or do not share a common ancestor. Theistic evolutionists often claim that the alleged common ancestry of all forms of life is a fact, even as they may acknowledge doubts about the creative power of the neo-Darwinian mechanism. Nevertheless, we have become skeptical about universal common descent. Notice the word become. Both of these authors started out not skeptical. In this chapter, we explain why, using the fossil evidence to illustrate how a scientifically informed person might reasonably come to doubt the arguments for universal common descent or universal common ancestry. After first describing the aspects of the fossil evidence that the theory of universal common descent explains well, so they're going to give you a good idea of the strengths of the arguments. We then examine other aspects of the fossil record that the theory does not explain as well or at all. We especially highlight the many discontinuous or abrupt appearances of new forms of life in the fossil record, a pattern that contradicts the continuous branching tree pattern of biological history postulated by proponents of universal common descent. That's a pretty good summary of what they're going to be doing. The introduction starts out. Contemporary neo-Darwinian theory has two main parts. The first part, which we have critiqued at length in the preceding chapters, asserts that the mechanism of natural selection and random genetic mutation has the capacity to generate major innovations or macroevolutionary change in the history of life. 
The second part of neo-Darwinism, the theory of universal common descent, concerns the pattern of change through biological history. Indeed, the theory of universal common descent is a theory about what happened in the history of life. The theory affirms that all known living organisms are descended for, from a single common ancestor somewhere long ago. Biology textbooks today often depict this idea, just as Darwin did, using a great branching tree. And I am going to skip over some of this, wherever you see green ellipses, we're moving on. Uh, whereas the mechanism of natural selection and random mutation describes how major evolutionary change allegedly happened, the process by which change occurs, the theory of universal common descent asserts that such major change did occur and occurred in a completely connected rather than disconnected or discontinuous way, the historical pattern of change. Darwin argued that the theory of universal common descent, or what he called descent with modification, best explained a variety of lines of biological evidence, including the succession of fossil forms, the geographical distribution of various species, and the anatomical and embryological similarities among otherwise different types of organisms. We looked at the embryology last week. Modern evolutionary biologists have added the genetic similarities or molecular homologies, homologies of otherwise different organisms to this list of evidence supporting common ancestry. Proponents of Darwinism have often heralded the fossil record as the most decisive evidence for common descent with modification. Philip uh, Gingrich even claimed that morphological continu continuity in the fossil record is the principal evidence favoring evolution as a historical explanation for the diversity of life. Well, that's Gingrich's opinion. On the other hand, those who doubt UCD have argued that the fossil record poses a severe challenge to the theory. Still, other proponents of universal common descent, including Richard Dawkins, have sought to foreclose any such criticism by arguing that we don't need fossils. The case for evolution is watertight without them, so it is paradoxical to use gaps in the fossil record as though they were evidence against evolution. Um, interestingly enough, uh, uh, he, he acknowledges that the Cambrian explosion was just as if they were planted there uh, and uh, w would be a delight to any creationist. Um, but that doesn't bother him. So what do the fossils tell about the history of life? And how strong is the case for the theory of universal common descent, the historical part of Darwinian theory? This chapter will examine the logical structure of the arguments for universal common descent with a particular focus on what the fossil record and the argument from fossil progression can tell us about whether all forms of life do or do not share a common ancestor. Logical structure of the argument. Yet before we look at any evidence, any of the evidence for or against universal common descent, it might be a good idea to examine the logical structure of the argument for it. Despite the presumed consensus in favor of universal common descent, there are good reasons for doubting the argument in its favor, reasons that are well illustrated by the fossil record and the competing possible interpretations of it. In particular, the argument for UCD depends on an often inconclusive or weak form of inference known as abduction. In abductive reasoning, scientists or detectives reason from effects or clues in the present back to causes in the past. To see the difference between abductive and deductive inference, consider the following argument schemata. Deduction, data A is given and plainly true. Uh, logic, but if A is true, then B is uh, true as a matter of course. And the conclusion is, hence B must be true as well. All men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Abduction, on the other hand, says the surprising effect that B is observed, and the logic says, but if A were true, then B would be uh, true as a matter of course. So therefore, there's reason to suspect that A is true. Notice the conclusion is not stated in the same way as the conclusion in uh, deduction. It is not totally secure. In deductive reasoning, if the premises are true, the conclusion follows with certainty. Abduction, however, does not produce certainty, but only plausibility or possibility. Unlike deduction, in which the minor premise affirms the antecedent variable, A, abductive reasoning affirms the consequent variable, B. In deductive logic, affirming the consequent variable with certainty constitutes a fallacy. 
The error derives from failing to acknowledge that more than one cause might explain the same evidence. To see why, consider this deductive fallacy. If it had rained, the streets would get wet. The streets are wet. Therefore, it rained. Well, maybe, but maybe not. Or symbolically, if R then W, W therefore R. Obviously, this argument has a problem. It does not follow that because the streets are wet, it necessarily rained. The streets may have gotten wet in some other way. A fire hydrant may have burst, a snowbank may have melted, or a street sweeper may have doused the streets before cleaning them. Nevertheless, that the streets are wet might indicate that it rained. Oddly, abductive arguments have the same logical structure as this fallacious form of deductive argument. They too affirm the consequent. For this reason, unless these inferences are strengthened using a process of elimination showing alternative hypotheses to be implausible, they remain weak or inconclusive. In PhD work at Cambridge, one of us, Steve Meyer, showed that the case for universal common descent is based on several abductive references from various classes of biological evidence, such as fossil succession, anatomical and molecular homology, embryological similarity, and biogeographical distribution. Consequently, as we have studied the case for universal common descent, we have both become gradually more skeptical about the theory because we find that the circumstantial evidence in favor of the theory is inconclusive at best. Moreover, we have found that the arguments for universal common descent were inconclusive for exactly the same reason that abductive arguments often are. For each class of evidence allegedly favoring the theory, more than one explanation or picture of biological history could account for it. Excuse me. As we will show, the fossil record illustrates this problem in spades. The case for universal common descent from paleontology. Even so, the theory of universal common descent offers an elegant explanation of several features of the fossil record. Thus, those features, at least when considered in isolation from other evidential considerations, seem to support the theory, provide support, it looks like that should read, provide support for the theory of universal common descent. I cut it and pasted it just the way they had it. Consider, for example, the evidence of fossil progression or succession. The fossil forms preserved in the layer of layers of sedimentary rock progress from simple organisms in older strata to or layers to more and more complex organisms in successively younger strata. According to proponents of UCD, this stratigraphic progression in the fossil record from less to more complex forms of life support the theory of common descent because this pattern is ex of evidence is exactly what the paleontologist should expect to find if all organisms did in fact descend from earlier, less complex ex ancestral forms. And though there are exceptions to it, the simplest to complex rule is roughly true. Thus, the general pattern of successful, successive temporal appearances agrees nicely with the Darwinian picture of the history of life. Moreover, the theory of universal common descent also explains other aspects of the fossil evidence, since again, the observed patterns are precisely what one would expect if all organisms had descended from earlier ancestral forms extending back to one universal common ancestor. For example, morphologically intermediate fossils, possible missing links. Paleontologists have discovered many fossils such as Archaeopteryx that appear morphologically intermediate between the putative ancestors and their descendants. By morphologically intermediate, paleontologists mean that the fossil forms in question display some, but not all, of the primitive characteristics of a putative ancestor group, while exhibiting some, but not all, of the derived characteristics of a putative descendant group. A derived character is a novel or changed genetic or anatomical feature not present in a putative ancestral form or more primitive state. Morphologically intermediate groups are not necessarily temporally intermediate, and there's a big difference between the two. That is, they may not have been in fa found in strata that lie in between putative ancestors and descendants. Similarly, such fossil forms may not have been found in the same geographical region as possible ancestors or descendants. Nevertheless, their similarities in form suggest the possibility of being transitional in time and space. So that's kind of the weak form. Even though there are still groups for which such forms are lacking, many morphologically intermediate forms do exist, 
such as the numerous morphologically intermediate forms between land mammals and whales that have been discovered in recent decades. Since the theory of universal common descent entails the existence of temporarily transitional intermediate forms, it would also predict the existence of many such at least morphologically intermediate forms in the fossil record. That such forms exist is therefore readily explained by universal common descent. Morphologically intermediate and temporarily, temporarily transitional series. In addition to morphologically intermediate fossils, paleontologists would also expect, based on the theory of universal common descent, that the fossil record would document some detailed transitional sequences, sequences where several intermediate forms lie temporarily in between the presumed ancestors and descendants in the sedimentary strata. Some examples of such sequences have been found in the fossil record. Famous examples are the horse series, icon number nine, you may remember, um, illustrating the successive transformation of the primitive three to four toed legs of Eocene hyracotherium, formerly known as Eohippus, some of us remember back that far, into the single hoofed legs of modern horses. Another is the mammal-like reptile series that illustrates the transition from the primary to secondary jaw articulation with the attachment of the three auditory ossicles. The evidence against universal common descent from paleontology. Notwithstanding the above evidence is in support of universal common descent, there is also strong paleontological evidence that does not easily square with the Darwinian notion of descent with modification via a gradual series of successive transformations from ancestral to descendant forms of life. In particular, the fossil record also manifests large morphological gaps and discont discontinuities between different groups of organisms, especially at the higher taxonomic levels of phyla classes and orders, representing the major morphological differences between different forms of life. With very few exceptions, the major groups of organisms come into the fossil record abruptly without discernible connections to earlier and generally simpler alleged ancestors in the fossil record. Indeed, leading evolutionary biologists and paleontologists have long acknowledged this pattern of discontinuity. Evolutionary biologist Ernst Meyer, one of the fathers of the modern Darwinian synthesis, famously noted that wherever we look at the living biota, discontinuities are overwhelmingly frequent. The discontinuities are even more striking in the fossil record. Now, one of the things that struck me about that quote was that there was no reference, whereas the book is otherwise extremely well referenced. So I looked it up, and yes, and indeed, it is a correct quote. And uh, if you're wondering, it comes from what evolution is uh, in 2001. Um, I have 189 in question mark because I was not able to locate that book, but I was able to locate the um, paperback version and on that, it's found, I think, in page two, uh, 206. So I presume that the 189 is, in fact, the correct page. But anyway, moreover, since publication of The Origin of Species in the late 19th century, our knowledge of the fossil record has greatly increased. Consequently, in most cases, fossil discontinuities can no longer be explained away as a result of alleged incomplete sampling of the fossil record. In fact, Paleontologist Michael Foote of the University of Chicago has noted as more and more fossil discoveries have been made, the new forms that these discoveries document consistently fall within existing higher ta taxonomic group, that is, phyla, subphyla, and classes. In other words, these new discoveries have repeatedly failed to document the rainbow of intermediate forms expected in the Darwinian view of the history of life, especially in the higher taxonomic levels. Foote has shown Using statistical sampling analysis, that as this pattern has become more and more pronounced, it has become ever more improbable that the absence of intermediate forms rec represents a a, reflects a sampling bias, that is, an artifact of either incomplete sampling or incomplete preservation. Increasingly, paleontologists accept that fossil discontinuities are real and need to ex be explained, not explained away. As Cleveland Hickman et al. note, most major groups of animals appear abruptly in the fossil record, fully formed and with no fossils yet discovered that form a transition from their parent group. Indeed, numerous fossil radiations or explosions of new forms of life are characterized by such abrupt appearances. To get a sense of how pervasive this discontinuous pattern is and how significant these events are in the history of life, consider the following short descriptions of several of the salient examples of the abrupt appearance 
of new forms of life in the fossil record. The origin of life itself. Evidence suggests that the first living cells arose very early in the history of planet Earth, almost as soon as conditions of our, on our planet would permit. Over the last several decades, most origin of life biologists and geochemists have placed the origin of the first life at about 3.8 billion years ago. Just after the cessation of the meteorite, meteorite bombardment of the Earth called the Late Heavy Bombardment, which is supposed to be 4 to 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago. Basically, it shows up as soon as it can. The latest evidence from biogenic carbon in zircon crystals suggests life was already present 4.1 billion years ago in the Hadean area, era, even before the late heavy bombardment, when life could survive only in subterranean niches. And how it got preserved is not clear. Either way, life seems to have arisen abruptly about as soon as it possibly could, given conditions on the early Earth. The origin of photosynthesis. <coughs> the origin of photosynthesis was a key event that made later plant and animal life on Earth possible. Photosynthesis involves two intricate integrated sets of complex biological processes known as photosystems 1 and 2, which are in turn made of many equally complex proteins. The earliest existence of cyanobacteria, the first photosynthetic cells, is documented by stromatolites from 3.7 billion year old rock from the Isua supercrustal belt in Greenland right after the Hadean area, remember. Nevertheless, indi indirect evidence suggests an even earlier origin of photosynthesis about 3.8 billion years ago. Because the late heavy meteorite bombardment, 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago, repeatedly boiled away the existing oceans into steam atmospheres and left only subterranean environmental niches, photosynthesis was possible in the Earth's ocean only after the bombardment ceased. That implies that photosynthesis, with all its integrated biochemical complexity, originated abruptly as soon as the Earth first offered a stable and suitable environment for the process to occur. Archaean genetic expansion. This event is not so much documented by real fossils as by the identification, uh, identification of fossil genes through genomic studies. Lawrence David and Eric Alm found that the genomic fossil record indicates that the collective genome of life expanded between 3.3 and 2.8 billion years ago. And they probably had to twist it to get it that low. During this period, 27% of all presently existing gene families came into being by rapid evolutionary innovation. Boom, all of a sudden it's all there. The Avalon explosion during the Ediacaran, the Latest period of the Precambrian era, an enigmatic group of or organisms appeared abruptly in the fossil record. Radiometric dating studies fixed the date for the first appearance of these Ediacaran fauna at about 575 to 565 million years ago. These strange marine organisms, the Garden of Ediacara, included microbial mats covering the sea bottom and enigmatic large sessile organisms that lacked any visible feeding apparatus and mostly have a quilted body with glide symmetry and fractal growth. Makes you wonder if they're plants. Whatever their classification, all groups originate abruptly without any known putative ancestors during what is known now as the Avalon Explosion. But, uh, indeed, the Ediacaran fossils provide evidence of a puzzling leap in biological complexity. Before the Ediacaran organisms appeared, the only living forms documented in the fossil record for over three billion years were single-celled organisms, colonial algae, and possible sponges. Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian explosion refers to a dramatic point a period in the history of life when many new and anatomically sophisticated animals appeared suddenly in the sedimentary layers of the geologic column without any discernible evidence of simpler ancestral forms in the earlier layers below. Fossil discoveries during this period attest to the first appearance of animals representing more than 20 phyla, the largest division of animal classification, as well as the many more subphyla and classes, each manifesting distinct body, distinctive body plans, whereas a body plan represents a unique arrangement of body parts and tissues. Indeed, animals representing most of the body plans that have ever existed on Earth first appeared during this explosive event. And uh, we've been through Darwin's doubt um, and covers it pretty well. Several unexpected f uh, features of the Cambrian explosion from a Darwinian point of view are the sudden appearance of new novel animal forms and an absence of transitional intermediate fossils 
con connecting the Cambrian animals to simpler Cambrian forms, a startling array of completely novel animal forms with novel body plans, and a pattern with, in which radical differences in the form in the fossil record arise before more minor small-scale diversifications and variations. This latter pattern turns on its head the Darwinian expectations of small incremental changes only gradually resulting in larger and larger differences in form. In any case, most Cambrian experts agree that the majority of the Cambrian animal phyla lack any putative fossil ancestors within the preceding Ediacaran biota. It's just boom. The great Ordovician biodiversification event, or is sometimes known as Gobi, while general animal body plans represent distinctive phyla, subphyla, and classes first appeared in the Cambrian explosion, these marine invertebrate groups greatly diversified on lower taxonomic levels, for example, about 300 new families, during a relatively short period of time in an event known as the Great Ordovician Biodiversification at about 485 to 460 million years ago. This explosive diversification of marine life has been called Life's Second Big Bang, by James O'Donohue, who, of course, is not a, an intelligent design advocate. The Devonian Necton Revolution, uh, Christine Klug et al. described a radical change in the composition of the marine fauna in the early Devonian. And then there's the Odontode Explosion, which uh, was coined by Fraser et al. for the s sudden appearance of vertebrate dentition. Within about 10 million years between the late Silurian and the early Devonian, all major groups of jawed fish with teeth and tooth-like structures, odontodes, appear abruptly in the fossil record. Just do. Then there's a Siluro-Devonian radiation of terrestrial biotas. The sudden origin and diversification of vascular land plants, as tracheophyte, in the late Silurian and early Devonian is one of the great mysteries in the history of life. Then there's a Carboniferous insect explosion in the Pennsylvania, up, or the Upper Carboniferous era, between 318 and 300 million years ago, when the world was dominated by vast swamp forests. A large diversity of different winged insects known uh, groups appeared suddenly without any known transitional forms in the older Mississippian or Devonian strata. Uh, there's a Triassic explosion. This event was also called the Early Triassic Metazoan Radiation, or Post-Permian Radiation. No new phyla and classes, but many new orders and families originate abruptly after the end Permian mass extinction, about 252 million years ago, among marine invertebrates, that is, bivalves and ceratites, insects, coleoptera, beetles, and diptera, flies, and tetrapods, see below. The early Triassic marine reptile radiation. After the first end Permian mass extinction, 15 different families of marine reptiles appear abruptly between 248 and 240 million years ago in the early Triassic. And then there's a mid-Triassic gliding reptile radiation. Within only 2 million years of the mid-Triassic, there is a sudden in appearance of gliding and flying reptiles. There's a Mosasaur radiation, sudden discontin discontinuous origins are found not only in the history of higher taxa, but also within subordinate groups. A good example is the abrupt origin and diversification of mosasaurs in the last 25 million years of the Upper Cretaceous. And I think I should have had uh, green dots after that. Uh, there's the radiation of flowering plants. Uh, Charles Darwin called the abrupt origin of flowering plants during the Cretaceous periods an abominable mystery. Indeed, nearly all fossils of modern angiosperms first ab appeared abruptly in the Cretaceous and then rapidly diversified between 130 and 115 million years ago. Darwin was deeply bothered by the pattern of their origin because the seemingly sudden appearance of so many angiosperm species in the upper chalk conflicted strongly with his gradualist perspective on evolutionary change. And that quote again is from a, somebody who is not an intelligent design supporter. Radiation of modern placental mammals. The first orders of placental mammals also appear abruptly in the fossil record during the Paleocene epoch between 62 and 49 million years ago without known precursors. Paleontologists call this series of events a mammalian rep, uh, radiation. 
The first fossil bat, for example, is unquestionably a bat capable of true flight. Yet we find nothing resembling a bat in the early Mesozoic fossil record. Radiation of modern birds. The lineages from 95% of modern bird species also originated abruptly during the Paleocene epoch or the tertiary or Paleogene period, as did most of the mammalian orders. Origin of genus Homo. John Hawkes et al. suggested that our own genus, Homo, originated abruptly two million years ago with, subsequent, uh, with sudden interrelated anatomical changes. This inspired a press release with the headline, New Studies Suggest Big Bang Theory of Human Evolution. See Chapter 11 by Casey Luskin for a more detailed discussion of the hominid fossil record. The top-down pattern of appearance. This pervasive pattern of fossil appearance raises an additional difficulty for the theory of universal common descent and the Darwinian picture of the history of life. Darwinian theory, both classical and modern, implies that as new animal forms first began to emerge from a common ancestor, they would be quite similar to each other and that larger differences in the form of life, what paleo paleontologists called disparity, would emerge only much later as the result of the accumulation of many small incremental changes. That's the standard theory. In its technical sense, disparity refers to the major differences in the form that separate the higher level taxonomic categories such as phyla, classes, and orders. In contrast, the term diversity refers to minor differences among organisms classified as different genera or species. Put another way, disparity refers to life basics themes, diversity refers to the variations on those themes. As former Oxford University neo-Darwinist and Darwinian biologist Richard Dawkins put it, what had been distinct species within one genus become in the fullness of time distinct genera within one family. Later, families will be found to have diverged to the point where taxonomists, specialists in classification, prefer to call them orders, then classes, then phyla. That's the standard theory. Skipping over a paragraph, the actual pattern in the fossil record, however, contradicts this expectation. Instead of more and more species eventually leading to more genera, leading to more families, orders, classes, and phyla, the fossil record shows representatives of separate phyla appearing first, followed by lower level of diversification on those basic themes. As paleontologist Douglas Irwin, James Valentine, and Jack uh, Sapkowski note, the fossil record suggests that the major pulse of diversification of phyla appear, occurs before that of orders, classes before that of, pardon me, uh, before that of classes, classes before that of orders, orders before that of families. The higher taxa do not seem to have diverged through an accumulation of lower taxa. Thus, the top-down pattern of appearance on display in the fossil record provides another evidential challenge to universal common descent. The polyphyletic interpretation of the fossil record, the pattern of appearance of major groups of organisms in the fossil record, both in the abruptness and discontinuity of those appearances and in the unexpected way in which disparity pre precedes diversity, seems to contradict the monophyletic picture of the history of life entailed by the theory of universal common descent. That suggests the possibility, at the very least, that the monophyletic picture may not be the one that best fits the fossil evidence. Consider instead the polyphyletic view of biological history. It depicts the history of life as an orchard of separate disconnected trees in which major new groups of plants and animals are introduced into the fossil record progressively and discontinuously. This view explains fossil succession equally well, but arguably describes the discontinuous pattern of appearance more accurately, or at least more naturally and simply without auxiliary hypotheses, than a monophyletic view does. Indeed, pervasive discontinuity is precisely what one should expect in the fossil record based on a polyphyletic view of the history of life. The polyphyletic view and morphological intermediates. But what about the intermediate forms of life discussed above that proponents of the common descent cite in, in support of their theory? How does their existence square with the claim that the fossil record shows a pervasive discontinuity? And how would a polyphyletic view explain such intermediates? Recall first that the, the, the distinction we made above between morphological and temporal intermediates. The vast majority of all intermediates in the fossil record exemplify the morphological rather than the temporal kind. For a fossil to be demonstrably part of a temporal sequence, that intermediate fossil must lie between a plausible ancestor 
and its possible descendants in the sedimentary strata. Consequently, when proponents of universal common ancestor descent assert that fossil intermediates are very common, and the doubters and doubters of descent claim that transitional fossils are mostly absent, neither side is strictly incorrect. Instead, both sides often talk past each other because they have different types of intermediates in mind. When proponents of universal common descent talk about transitional fossils, they usually refer to fossils such as Archaeopteryx that exhibit a mosaic of characters, wherein some, but not all, of the characters from a proposed putative ancestor group, such as reptiles, are present in the intermediate form, while at the same time some, but not all, of the characteristics of a putative descendant group, such as birds, are also present in the intermediate. As noted above, the theory of inter universal common descent would expect that many such morphologically intermediate forms would be present in the fossil record, and indeed, they are. Thus, universal common descent can offer a ready explanation for the presence of many such intermediates in the record, especially the many forms that lie morphologically in between different higher taxa, orders, and families. It must be noted, however, that most of such transitional fossils also exhibit specialized anatomical features that exclude them from the direct ancestral lineage and place them on side branches of the tree close to the alleged descendants. They are not putative ancestors. Nevertheless, a polyphyletic, group, uh, polyphyletic view of the history of life can account for such morphologically intermediate forms as well, given the otherwise pervasive discontinuity and absence of genuine transitional sequences, that is, temporal intermediates, between major groups of organisms discussed above, proponents of a polyphyletic view do not regard fossils such as Archaeopteryx as representatives of a temporary, temporally transitional sequence leading from ancestor to descendant, nor need they do so, but instead as precisely a mosaic of traits produced by an intelligent designer. The polyphyletic view, discontinuity, and alleged transitional intermediates. For this reason, to decide whether a polyphyletic or monophyletic view of the history of life best fits the data, we think the most important class of evidence to consider remains the pervasive pattern of discontinuity and the abrupt appearance of major, major groups of organisms. Consider the alleged sequence to the fully aquatic whales. Though often cited as an example of smooth evolutionary transition, this alleged Transitional sequence itself displays dramatic evidence of, walk, of abrupt appearance. In the walking whales from land to water in 8 million years, leading cetacean paleontologist G.M. Thewissen admits that in a dramatic transition, whales were undergoing fast evolutionary change with features that change abruptly. The basilosaurids even predate some of their supposed proteceded ancestors such as the 47.5 million year old proto-whale Myocetus, a mammal that gave birth on land, had well-developed hind limbs, and lacked even rudimentary tail flukes. Similar, though arguably more acute problems afflict the putative reptile-like mammal transitional sequence, which it would be lovely to have that fleshed out a little more. Skipping over a paragraph, other classes of evidence in the theory of universal common descent. We have found this same logical relationship obtains between other classes of biological evidences and these competing views of biological history. If only some facts of the evidence in question are considered, then a monophyletic view of the history of life explains the evidence as well as a polyphyletic view. But if other facets of that evidence are considered, then a polyphyletic view ends up providing a more adequate explanation of all the facets of that relevant class of evidence. Um, they talk about molecular homology, and it's great. I uh, wish we had time to consider it in a little more detail. Many studies have shown, however, that trees derived from analyses of anatomy often conflict with trees based on biomacromolecules. Some recent examples for mo molecular and morphological data producing wildly different phylogenetic trees are grasses, metazoan animals, reptiles, that is, the position of turtles, which... Uh, Dr. Roth is uh, somewhat familiar with, and lizards. Worse, various molecular analyses often generate wildly different evolutionary trees. 
More recently, genomics experts have found thousands of genes in different organisms with no known similarity to any other known gene. The pervasiveness of these non-homologous orphan genes is completely unexpected, giving universal common descent. And I would have to agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, orphan genes are a killer. Finally, there are instances where the uni evidence for universal common descent has simply crumbled. In the origin, Darwin claimed that embryos of different classes of vertebrates pro progressed through similar phases of development as they grew from embryo to adults. Uh, he thought this indicated that different vertebrate classes shared a common ancestor in which the common pattern of development first originated. It turns out, however, that different classes of vertebrates do not progress through similar phases of embryological development. And uh, that is a green dot, unfortunately, I miscoloring it. Conclusion. In summary, the case for universal common descent rests in part on the factual claims that have evaporate, evaporated, circumstantial evidence that admits alternative explanation, and evidence such as fossil discontinuity and conflicting phylogenetic trees that is better explained by a polyphyletic view of biological history. For that reason, we have both, come, both become skeptical about the theory of universal common descent and versions of theistic evolution that affirm this second meaning of evolution as described in the scientific and philosophical introduction to this volume. Now, my take on all this, the book is not supposed to take sides. You remember reading that in the introduction between the three large branches of intelligent design, that is, young life creationism, old, I'll call it old life creationism, and God-assisted evolution. Yet it does. God-assisted evolution could always argue that the transitions happen too rapidly to be fossilized. But at that point... God-assisted evolution is really effectively old earth, uh, old life creationism. Now, one begins to get the feeling that the options are slowly moving away from the middle towards the ends. Stephen Meyer did not start out trying to question common ancestry, but merely to ask whether materialistic forces could produce information. Look where he is now. He's one of the authors of this chapter. Gunther Beckley did not start out by trying to reject common descent. In fact, he was an enthusiastic evolutionist, merely questioning an uh, atheistic evolutionist, merely questioning the adequacy of materialism at one point. Look where he is now. Watch what happens in the rest of the book as we move from science to philosophy, to theology. At least in my opinion, if you take hold of the truth that you know and follow it faithfully, you will eventually get to the man who said, I am the truth. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. This is a fascinating topic. Uh, they touched in the beginning on the question of the sequence, the uniqueness at various levels, uh, which they did not uh, address very much later on in the chapter, uh, and which to me is one of the more significant issues we need to address. Um, and uh, ecological zonation, which you may be familiar with, may not be familiar with, uh, is often dismissed as, uh, well, it's nothing fits it type of thing. I would uh, simply argue that in general, ecological zonation does fit what you'd expect, and that you have first microorganisms in the Precambrian, all kinds of them, and you don't have large organisms there, which is, explains 
Well, we have that right now on the present earth. Supposedly, mm-hmm. we got more life, according to some specialists, mm-hmm. uh, who tend to exaggerate. We have more life beneath the surface of the earth than we have on top of it. But anyway, there's a lot of life down there. It's all microscopic, and that's what you have. Uh, then you got this Cambrian explosion, which, according to Eclatus, you see, was represented the lowest seas, and this is striking in the fact that we're dealing with marine organisms here, and we, we deal with more marine organisms up into the Silurian. Uh, why no terrestrial organisms before that? Uh, this striking data in favor of ecological zonation, where it has difficulty is uh, in especially in the higher layers where you have uniqueness at much at much finer scale. Ichthyosaurs all over the world are about the same level, and I could give you all kinds of examples like that. The only explanation I would suggest for that is that the biota, bio, biotic distribution before the flood was probably more organized than it was at present right now, it's more chaotic. But that is a problem, I think, that uh, we need to be concerned with. But uh, the problems on the other side are so tremendous that uh, I still choose to go that route. Well, one thing to keep in mind is that the book, uh, Gunter Beckley, I, I think, is still sorting through where he believes. Uh, but Stephen Meyer is actually a believer in old ages. And so for him, he's not really asking the question, can you fit this into a flood? What he's really asking is, does it fit into a branching tree? And he's saying no. But then you look at the broader picture here. Wouldn't it be kind of a strange kind of God who would create uh, all these things? Uh, he, obviously, if you create life, uh, he has all, and these die off, and so he creates another bunch, and they die off, and so on. What kind of an intelligent God would do? I mean, uh, you're not going to fit this into a, a broader picture very easily. Yes, I I would have to agree with you, and that's... Why, when we get to the philosophical and theological stuff, it really gets fun. Because that's the point at which, uh, at which those kinds of questions come up. Yes. What do you think about the uh, fragments of vascular plants in the Precambrian and pollen and stuff like that? Um, don't look here. Nothing to see. Move on. Okay. So uh, there's, there's, there's Precambrian pollen, too, in Venezuela, although I'm not sure that we can go over there to do an expedition quite yet. But There's uh, been several papers uh, published on it, uh, but not recently, but a while back, and I've never seen them really contradicted aside from arguments from contamination, but it seems like the contamination doesn't explain the fragments of actual vascular plants, not just the pollen. Uh, the same thing is true in India. Yeah, that's there's where a the, lot of stuff that's, uh, that's especially in India. The especially in India, right. and and nobody's looking at it. It's like the Indian people it looks are like doing this their don't thing. Don't seem to mention just, it. They just say they talk about standard patterns without talking about some things like this that seem to to dramatically undermine the standard Darwinian story. Yeah, but um, certainly the branching trees. I just completely. But, but like out. you say. It was it was very interesting. I mean, I've brought this up in some discussions at one point, and they uh, basically the response is mostly to just ignore it. And beyond that, let's say let's say it is, does look exactly like a tree, which it doesn't, but let's say it does. Let's say you found something that looks exactly like a tree. Well, you you still don't have a mechanism. Uh, the best you could say is that you have to have a god that did it, 
that way, a designer of some kind that did it that way, because the naturalistic mechanism, the Darwinian mechanisms, can't explain how to produce the tree itself, right. even, if, even if you had one. But the important thing, and this is what they're driving at now, is you don't have a tree. Right, you don't have a tree. So, And without a tree, the question of you trying to... You just have to a f- bunch of sticks in the mud, right? Uh, your, yeah. your tree got blown to bits, and now it's sticking randomly in the mud, and you're like, what happened? Yeah, what, what you have is more ac- akin to an orchard. Right. Uh, an orchard on different levels. I mean, yes. you've got little bushes stuck yes. here and there and, and the everywhere. Bushes here and there. And the, and the interesting thing is that um, if you take that orchard as being, you know, definitive, then... So, well, as far as this orchard goes, these little bushes, they don't talk here either in this book about the footprints evolving before the bodies. I, I think that's dramatic. Like, you've got evolutionary footprints... And then the bodies for the footprints are on higher levels. That the bodies evolved before the footprint or after the footprints. Well, I mean, that, they don't talk about that. Well, what's interesting is that that actually can transform what would have ordinarily been thought of as a um, as a temporal intermediate into a morphological intermediate. The best you could, you example, could argue that way if you didn't know that footprints can't just make themselves. Right. right? Well, uh, the, the, the example I can give is Tickleg that was found in just the right layer when they were looking for it until they found out that there were tetrapod footprints 75 million years earlier, according to standard dating. With no body. With no body. Right. So, so but all of a sudden... And also, the footprints themselves are ordered. They're classify. They're classifiable. You know, they look like they have an evolutionary sequence. You know, the footprints themselves are, are layered, and then the bodies that belong to the footprints are in higher layers. So you're like, that makes well, you scratch your head a bit, right? It, it gets really sticky when you have things like you have a sequence that is dated by a a an index fossil, so it's done fossil dating. And by potassium argon dating, and then you find these tracks, and they look for all the word the world like birds. So there must have been some dinosaurs that 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 had uh, bird like feet. Bird like feet and no body. Well, yeah, it, it gets know? worse because then people are looking at the tracks more carefully, and there are tracks that suddenly stop. Uh, you know, start with a. Kind of the thumbs digging in. Right, they're flying. They're flying. Right. They're landing, you know, and, and then they're starting to walk off. And it's like, no, no, these are not dinosaurs. These are birds. And all of a sudden, the dating of that entire layer has to be redone, and it's to be done by lead-lead dating that gave it the, the uh, date they needed. The younger date, yeah. Yeah, no, the dating, the dating on these things is even worse, but... What, what really strikes me is, is these evolutionary sequences seem to fit better with a catastrophic model because you have evolutionary sequences and things that you know can't be physically evolving. And the only way to sort these things out is with some kind of catastrophe that buries things in, in another type of sequence, a sequence of survival, rather than a sequence of, of one life giving birth to another type of life. It's a, it is a sequence. It's an evolutionary or a pattern sequence for sure, but it, it doesn't represent an evolution of life. It represents survivability of right. life. Right. Uh, yes, comment here. <laughs> You'll get it in a minute. It- okay. I, in my experience of over a number of years, the presentation today is most convincing to those who are looking for a uh, a foundation for a belief that isn't in agreement with UCD. However, as uh, as you look at it carefully, uh, the the Cambrian explosion just comes up over and over and over again, and it's a dramatic discontinuity. However. Students who really are inquiring, looking for as much of a foundation they can find, 
ask awkward questions. Like, okay, you go back to Cambrian explosion, you see that rich diversity of organisms unlike anything uh, you would have predicted. However, if you go to as close to a similar kind of environment today, there isn't a single of those organisms that survived. You look in the same sources. And I'm not, this personally is not a telling critique for me and for most of the students I knew, but it still leaves some huge unanswered questions that give those who wish to feel more strongly about coming closer to universal common descent than the polyphyletic evolution, which is overall best solution, it still gives them reason to go looking and saying, no, the other doesn't give, give an adequate answer. So I think I'll end my comment with there's room for a great deal of faith, which needs to be very well and strongly founded to leave you with an interpretation which maybe is the best you can do at that time as long as you're willing to live with, it, with intellectual patience. Uh, Jack just shared some of his background and experience working with students. I was once a student at Michigan State University in the 1970s working on my degree in, in paleobotany. But I remember taking a class from a professor, Professor Anstey, who was a verte invertebrate paleontologist. And so we were looking at the marine picture, and Dr. Roth mentioned um, the ecological zonation um, picture, which it's overall, it's true. There is a kind of a match, and you have, um, at the very lowest levels, you have only marine organisms. But I remember Dr. Anstey, who studied for the Roman Catholic priesthood at one time and then went into paleontology. So he, he knew quite a bit about creationists. I don't know, excuse me, I don't know if he knew that I was a creationist sitting in his classroom. But I remember when he organized the various eras of the geological column going from totally invertebrates then to the vertebrates and the first land plants and each era has some highlights like dinosaurs, Jurassic and Cretaceous, uh, Cenozoic, mammals, proliferation of mammals, which was presented today, and birds as well, proliferation in the Paleogene. So he had a, the whole picture for the class. I picture him stepping back, looking at that, and he said, hmm, looks like special creation. But we know that Darwinism is true, so we've got to move on. And I thought that was a very telling comment. First of all, how did he know the term special creation? Unless he had read maybe Frank Marsh and some of the uh, creationist authors that had used that term. And uh, secondly, that involves divine activity. And I think in a way he was willing to admit, yes, God started it all. So I, that was... That was a very eye-opening experience for me at Michigan State University. Would you call that intellectual patience? Intellectual what? Patience. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, it, it's probably fair to say if they can do it, why not us? Yeah. So you find there are a lot of honest souls there. and they, Even Dawkins, as mentioned on the screen here, Dawkins admitted we have a problem with the Cambrian explosion. Big time problem. My training is in paleobotany. Big time problem with uh, origin angiosperms, flowering plants. And for the last 20 years, about every two or three years, there's an article saying Darwin's abominable mystery is still a mystery today. I'm quoting almost verbatim from paleontologist after paleontologist. And in 2000, 
17, there was a major article on the origin of flowering plants. One of the four or five authors was Peter Crane, used to be at the Museum of Natural History in Chicago, the Field Museum. He had close contacts with Andrews University, by the way, and he had come and lecture for students at, at Andrews uh, on the plant fossil record. Dennis Woodman would invite him for that. I don't know if you attended some of the lectures, probably, maybe all of them. I was there for at least two of them. But here, 2017, Peter Crane and his colleagues, the top paleontologists, paleobotanists in the world, admit that we don't have a valid, verifiable um, track record for flowering plants before the Cretaceous. Except for in Venezuela. Um, yeah, they will, they will strongly dispute with you, <laughs> Sean, and you need to interact with them, too. That's important. You need to get their ear. Actually, the radiometric dating is, is pre-Cretaceous. For these, oh, for these. oh, I know. Yes, yeah. and so how, how do you explain fragments embedded in the rock? I mean, not just like tiny yeah. little pollen grains that you might argue are contamination, but actual fragments of plants. Yeah. You know, well, this. I'm aware of those reports. I've read all of them. Uh, the point is, the point is that we are on a stronger basis as creationists if we can argue there are no valid ancestors for angiosperms, well, and therefore intelligent design well, I think one of the a divine power. So we're much better off, and paleontologists would love to find a much longer track record. They would they love can, that, but they can't. Most of the time. Well, I think point. one of the major points that was brought up in this book is that the the first appearance of a phylum, uh, not based on the general appearance of, of basic species from a previous phylum, it just comes in brand new with a brand new phylum appears by itself and then diversifies after that. Right? Very good that, point. That's a Very huge. Good. That's ups, That's an entirely upside down expectation, yeah. and it's consistent throughout the fossil yeah. record. And it that is. that is best explained again by catastrophe, because you would expect the 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 rare phylum would be trapped first. The first example of a phylum would be trapped sure. first and lower record in a catastrophe, and then as you move up, more and more common examples of that phylum would be also trapped. And so it's much more, an upside down perspective on that, the first appearance of a phylum is much more consistent with a catastrophe. I like that. Uh, yeah. Sure. Kind of a philosophical question. Is, uh, is the study of the fossil record more of a biological field or geological field to study? Yeah, and what's the, the interplay it, between the two? It's a combination of both. And uh, uh, that's what makes paleontology so interesting is that it sits right on the fence of, of geology versus biology. Obviously, the the creatures that were that have been entombed were once living, and they, you know, uh, in in the fossil record. In the fossil record, and that is that's getting particularly interesting because now it's actually turning as much into biology as it is into uh, geology. It's no longer, well, these kinds of animals were living then. It, we're starting to be able to say, and they had this kind of protein of various kinds, collagen and osteocalcin being two that, that seem to have made it through. But there's uh, some I indications for hemoglobin getting through. Not which hemoglobin, but like sequenceable antigenically active hemoglobin. Uh, and and if, you, if you think about... If you think about how long hemoglobin normally lasts, it just uh, it starts to become weird. Let's say. <laughs> anyway. Even formal and fixed proteins, like um, the pathology, they make formal and fixed blocks of tissue. Those tissues, if you put them on a the slide, you cut them out. Okay, the let's give you a, a mic here. <laughs> they, they they lose their antigenicity just sitting in in our storage in cold storage. 
like at freezing levels, they lose their anagenicity within a decade or so. You can't stain them with your immunostain slides. So it's amazing that these proteins that are preserved actually maintain their anagenicity. That's extraordinary. I mean, because these molecules, they shake. They vibrate at room temperature. And, and these fossils are preserved at room temperature, basically. I mean, they're not at freezing point. And so these molecules are vibrating, and they, they start to fall apart because of their, it's called kinetic chemistry. And because of their vibrations, they start to fall apart. They should not survive more than 100,000 years uh, in any sequenceable manner. That's where maybe geology, um, geological explanations come into play. Geology, geology cannot explain the preservation of that. Certainly not over a hundred thousand years. Yeah. Well, you're right. It's a catastrophism, but it's it's also a question of the timing of the catastrophism, and uh, it. I, I think we're getting more and more comfortable with the idea that. Uh, that maybe these things aren't really as old as uh, as the standard uh, view of things goes, and of course, uh, well, you know, they just now they uh, just last month they published uh, dating radio radiocarbon dating on the new uh, unfrozen Baffin Island regions uh, inside the Arctic Circle. For the first time ever, the ice has receded to the point where they can get the uh, fragments of plants and carbon date them. And those, those, and, and these, these are supposed to be covered by ice for hundreds of thousands of years. Do, do you know what the, uh, uh, what the uh, age of the plants is supposed to be? The age of the plants is supposed to be over 100, 150,000 years old. It's supposed to be. But they're dating within, the, the range of the carbon-14 is within 22,000 and 47,000 years. That's the carbon date. And you're like, that's amazing. That's the same date as the mammoths and the bison and everything else in the same region that they're dating uh, carbon-14 wise. And you're like, well, that's pretty interesting. And that just came out last month. Uh, it's, there is, there's, a, one of the things creationists have done for too long is play defense on this question and try to take the data that evolutionists find and then try to explain how it works. And I think we'll be far better off if we actually start doing our own research on some of this, coming up with the data, publishing it, and then letting them try to explain our data rather than vice versa. Also, we need our own carbon-14 lab because um, the, the carbon-14 dating that's been done on the dinosaur remains, the soft tissues and dinosaurs, also dates in the same range, 22,000, 47,000 years. All of it dates in the same range. And you're like... That's very interesting as well, but no one will publish that in mainstream literature, and so we need to we need to kind of do our own thing on that as well. Anyway, next week you're going to see a critique, another critique on uh, universal common descent, this time by Casey Luskin uh, of the Discovery Institute, and I think in two more weeks we're going to get people start to argue that humans and chimps don't have a common ancestor. And we've seen some of the arguments here in class before. It'll be interesting to see how they approach the subject. So um, come back. We'll have some more fun.